have uh, uh, everybody um, here on this second uh, online hot politics uh, lab meeting, uh, which um, the, the lockdown of our university, the University of Amsterdam, has uh, forced uh, Gijs Schumacher and myself to rethink how we could have lab meetings. And um, we thought we're going to uh, go and try to do this online in a more webinar st as, uh, style uh, thing. So we're the hot politics lab and we're broadly interested in trying to understand how uh, psychological concepts such as personality and emotions help us understand uh, the politics at the elite and at the citizens level. Um, and uh, today uh, we, we're very happy to have Stuart and Gijs will introduce uh, you, uh, Stuart. Yes, uh, thank you, Bert. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited today to have Stuart Soroka. I won't say in the house, but uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, Stuart was supposed to be in Amsterdam uh, last Tuesday, uh, giving a talk here and then uh, obviously having dinner. Uh, but unfortunately, this was, this was canceled uh, for obvious reasons uh, a few weeks ago. So I'm really happy that you know, we have the opportunity now to do the same thing, but then uh, over Zoom. Um, also very happy to see now almost 50 participants, so that, that's looking really good. Um, let me introduce uh, Stuart. Stuart is the Michael Trogas Professor uh, of Communication and Media and Political Science at the University of Michigan. And he uh, has published extensively in, well, let me put it this way, it took me a while to download the PDF that contained his CV. Uh, and uh, he has published extensively on news, the negativity of news, how people respond to negative news. But he is also has an extensive line of uh, research on the linkage between public opinion and uh, uh, public policy, and possibly more research lines that I, I don't know about yet. Um, today, uh, well, obviously, it's a good time to talk about negative news. I don't really have the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that since 1672, we, we haven't had so much negative news in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and, and for those non-Dutch, 1672 is the Rampjaar, the year of the big disasters. Everything closed down. We were invaded by all countries around us, and it was a terrible year. Um, the difference now being that this is a global crisis, obviously. Okay, uh, Stuart will talk about uh, uh, negativity in news and how people respond to this. Uh, I've, we've already seen on Twitter a very interesting graph on a New York Times coverage of uh, the corona news. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to what Stuart has to say. And um, so uh, after the talk, you have the possibility to ask questions. And you can use the Q&A button for this. So there's below in the screen, uh, next to share screen, the green button, there's Q&A. Post your question there. Uh, Bert will moderate the conversation. but we work on a first post, first uh, question survey. So. Okay, Stuart, now I give the, the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very kind introduction. I'm going to um, see if I can get this going. Is that working? Everyone can see the, um, the slide? Okay, good. Uh, so the talk I'm going to give today is called The Increasing Viability of Good News. It's a an argument that I've been playing with for a few months now. Um, and it's part of it is the talk that I had intended to give in Amsterdam. I think that if the, if the argument works, uh, then it might be something that I, uh, that I want to write up. And I'm kind of playing with it in the form of a talk for a little while before I, before I do that. I'm going to try to connect it to some coronavirus related news. Uh, because um, I'm finding it's increasingly difficult to sustain the argument that there's an increasing viability for good news in the face of all this coronavirus news. Um, but I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm going to reference co-authored work throughout the talk with different uh, fantastic co-authors, uh, and I have placed links to that work on. Um, on the web page that's referenced at the bottom of this slide, snsoroka.com slash good dash news. And that web page looks like this. It has kind of an abstract of the talk, and then it has links to it has the kind of basic argument and links to all the work that I'm gonna that I'm gonna use by all the many smart people I've had the good fortune of working with. My argument then is something like this. Uh, I want to start with the following question. Do changes in media competition and user curated content mean that current affairs news will be endlessly sensationalistic and negative? 
I think the default response to that is yes, that we look at the state of uh, Twitter, for instance, or we look at the state of the news, particularly in o over the past few months, but not just over the past few months, over the past decade or two decades, um, and think that the, the, kind of the structure of news, what we understand to be news, the incentive structure for, uh, for commercial news organizations and the behavior of individual humans selecting news and redistributing news, that all of that is going to produce a kind of news environment that remains systematically negative as it has been since the beginning, but becomes increasingly, increasingly more so. That we are descending into this pit of endless negativity and that that's gonna be problematic for a whole bunch of reasons. We know, for instance, that negative news coverage um, is problematic for engagement with politics, for interest uh, in politics, and also for people's general state of mind and also for our understanding of the world around us, the purpose one of the central functions of news is to give us kind of accurate sense for what's going on in the world. And if news is systematically biased in any given way, in this case, towards negativity, then what we have are a bunch of people making decisions uh, based on false information, or at least systematically biased information. So that's the reason why we care whether news is, uh, is gonna be systematically negative. Those are the reasons why we might care that news is biased towards the negative. Uh, I'm gonna argue now, however, uh, that I don't expect news to be endlessly sensationalistic and negative. I, I think there are gonna be, there are at least three reasons why we don't, why we should not expect news to be endlessly negative and sensationalistic. And I'm gonna outline those three reasons now. Before I dive in, I'm gonna note that part of what this talk is, is a, um, is you know my own working through an argument that I've made in the past, which has uh, tended to focus uh, on the average tendency of humans. That is, on average, humans prioritize negative information more than, uh, more than positive information, and on average, media prioritize negative information more than positive information. And I'm not going to make that argument again here. I'm just going to, let's just take that as the starting point. Let's take that as the, the basis the kind of beginning of the talk. On average, that is the human tendency. What I wanna focus on now is the possibility that that average changes, that ch average changes across individuals and over time and so on. And I wanna start with the over time part. Argument number one, uh, no, we shouldn't expect media to be endlessly negative and sensationalistic because valence-based asymmetries and asymmetric responses to positive versus negative information, they vary over time. And here I'm drawing on some co-authored work with PJ Lamberson at UCLA, uh, the kind of basic argument is at least um, the literature that I'm familiar with is drawn from in the impression formation literature in the 1960s in psychology, a literature that argues that um, attentiveness is not so much, uh, that is increased attentiveness to negativity may not be so much about negativity per se as outlyingness. It's what we care about is information that deviates from our expectations. And that's a kind of reasonable way of managing a very complex information environment to focus on the information that is most at odds with our expectations that may demand some kind of uh, change in behavior. And in, in that argument, our tendency to weight negativity more than positivity uh, has to do with an expectation that isn't neutral, an expectation that is marginally positive. So imagine that we can distribute all information on this scale from blue to red, from let's say positive to negative. And if our expectation is zero, then the kind of outlyingness spreads out in either direction too, in this case, four and four. I don't know what four is. I don't know what units we're talking about here. We're talking about units away from your expectations though. Now, if in general, humans expect something that is marginally positive, then negative information becomes more outlying than positive information. That is negative information can be much more outlying than positive information. And there's work in evolutionary psychology uh, to suggest that humans actually have an expectation that isn't in the middle. The, our expectation is a little bit positive. And that it's that kind of positivity offset that then leads to this asymmetry in the impact of negative versus positive information. But if you believe that, then you might also believe that our expectations can change over time. When you open a newspaper today, you have a set of expectations about what's going to be in there. I'm doing this as though people still open a newspaper. But imagine you're opening a newspaper today. Um, 
your expectations of what's in that newspaper are conditioned by what by what you've been reading in that newspaper over the last few months. So you have some expectations going in and your expectation probably is not marginally positive. Your expectation might be more on the negative side. I'm kind of dreading opening up a newspaper in the morning. Like, I, I, I guess I have to do this, but how negative is this going to get? And if your expectation varies over time, then the scope for outlying this varies over time. And now negative information is not so outlying for me. If I open the newspaper and I read something, uh, uh, something negative about the coronavirus, for instance, that's not coming as a shock to me. My expectations have adjusted. And because my expectations have adjusted in that way, now the positive information may be more outlying. Now I may be seeking out or more attentive to positive information as opposed to negative information. And that's one reason why we might expect that news content will not be endlessly negative and sensationalistic, because eventually we hit our limit. Eventually, we our expectations shift. And if it's outlyingness that matters, not negativity per se, then the scope for outlyingness on the positive and negative side of distribution change. Now, net positive things become more outlying, our attentiveness shifts, and we might expect media coverage to adjust accordingly. That's one reason, but I, I, want, I want to argue now for a second reason. Uh, and that, uh, and, and the first reason hinges on our like reaching our limit. Everything gets so negative that we just, we start thinking about things. We start looking for things that are more positive. I want to argue now cross-sectionally that at any given moment in time, there will be people who exhibit negativity biases and there will be people who do not exhibit negativity biases. My own work for a, a long time focused on the average focused on uh, the kind of median person who tends on average to exhibit a negativity bias, quite possibly because of the positivity offset that, uh, that we talked about, that I talked about just a little bit earlier. But uh, work uh, in sur like survey-based work and headline selection tasks and cross-national psychophysiological analyses have suggested to myself and to co-authors that actually there's a lot of individual level variation. There's a lot of heterogeneity at any given moment in time. And I'm gonna draw here on some work with Patrick Fournier and Lila Kneer. What I'm gonna show you are some distributions drawn from a little over 1,100 participants across seven, uh, 17 countries. And these participants watched randomly ordered BBC news stories while we capture um, their skin conductance and their heart rate. And I'm gonna to focus today just on one piece of information, heart rate variability which is intended to capture some combination of focus, which decreases heart rate, and excitement, which increases heart rate. So that creates an in increase in heart rate variability. And it tends to be true on average, we know from past work and from our work across all of these countries, that across all of these countries, humans exhibit greater attentiveness and, uh, and greater activation psychophysiological activation in response to negative stories as opposed to positive stories. That's the kind of baseline average finding, right? So if we look at new, the relationship between news tone and heart rate variability across all of those respondents, what we see is an increase in heart rate variability from positive to neutral to negative. As in, as we move across the scale, and in this case, television news coverage, negative stories are producing heightened attentiveness and heightened activation in relation, in comparison with neutral stories and in comparison with positive stories, which almost are kind of lulling us into a reduced level of attentiveness and activation. That's the average, and that can be used, that, that finding can and has been used to account for why media look the way they do. Right? If media are targeting the kind of average person, then the average person is gonna be more attentive, more activated, by negative information than by positive information. And this tendency, this kind of underlying tendency in human psychology and information processing is gonna drive then media coverage, as in, in, in seeking an audience, there will be a benefit to presenting negative information, assuming that attentiveness and, act, uh, and activation are what, are what audience seeking news organizations want, and there's reason to believe that that's what they want. But here's the thing, that's just the average. And I spent a lot too much time focused just on that average and not enough time thinking about the variation around that average. And so what we've been looking at in the background is the variation around that average. And here you have that variation in, in every country. So and for any given country, what you have here is a distribution of 
in this instance, coefficients from time series regression models for every single individual in the data set that traces over the 30 minutes for which we have their physiology, uh, the differential impact of negative information over positive information on their heart rate variability, that is on their attentiveness and activation. And the critical part to draw from this is, first of all, there aren't systematic differences across countries. That is, there's a lot of within country variation, but we don't see one country at one end of the spectrum and another country at the other end of the spectrum. It's not the case that Brazilians all show negativity biases and the Brits do not, for instance. There's a lot of variation within each country. And that variation tends to uh, have a mean that is on the red side, that is a mean that shows, that, that, that suggests that on average, individuals are more activated and attentive to negative information, but a lot of variation around that mean too. And in most of these countries and across the whole sample, maybe 40% of humans in this case exhibit positivity biases. So the average tendency is a negativity bias, but there's a lot of variation around that average. And that means that at any given moment in time, forget the time, the kind of the, the, the first possibility that if things get negative enough, we might start worrying about positive information. We might start seeking positive information. Independent of that, at any given moment in time, there is a lot of variation in human reaction, in, in human information processing of negative information versus positive information. And that's because we're all experiencing different, I think it's because we're, we're all experiencing different distributions of information over the course of our day, that our, our reaction to the television news, for instance, that we're showing people in a lab, that those reactions are conditioned by what that person has been doing before they got to the lab. It's conditioned by their baseline tendency, plus all of their recent information experiences. And that's gonna mean that at any given moment in time, there actually is a fair bit of heterogeneity in people's seeking of, or attentiveness to, or activation by, negative versus positive news. That then opens up the possibility of an audience for positive rather than negative news almost any time. That, that latter point is important because now I need my third argument. The reason we don't expect endless negativity and sensationalism in media coverage is also because technological change now facilitates uh, diversity of news platforms catering to a diversity of preferences. When what we had were a few big networks and major newspapers, a limited number of newspapers in any given market, and they were producing news in order to generate an audience, it made sense for those outlets to produce news that is targeted at the average person. And the average person exhibits a negativity bias. So we should expect that major television networks, for instance, or major newspapers, or major radio stations, that they're all going to produce news that is targeted at that one individual, news that leans toward the negative. But the world has changed. Technology has changed. And now we can have a, not only is it true that uh, the kind of the news hole for any given newspaper has expanded because they can be posting things online, but there can be many, many, many more newspapers. There, there can be, uh, in, there can, we can have news that is circulated by news organizations and then recirculated by other humans. The nature of kind of information distribution has changed fundamentally. And it's that technological change alongside the recognition that there is a lot of diversity in attentiveness and um, activation to positive versus negative news stories. It's those things in combination that produce the possibility for really a fundamentally different kind of information flow. I, I want to demonstrate that in, 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 in one way, drawing on a, on a forthcoming paper with co-authors in which we look at the news stories that are read and, and, and then news stories that are redistributed by various means. From the, um, from the New York Times. And, and I wanna do this because I wanna highlight not just the possibility that now any given media outlet can produce more news content and find audiences for that news content, but I also wanna highlight the possibility that as we move to news coverage being recirculated by many, many, many individuals, particularly on social media platforms, we change the 
uh, the priorities given to different types of information. For instance, there's, a, um, there's good work on self-presentation in social media that suggests that uh, when we post something on social media, we're not just recirculating the information that we think is most important, we're kind of curating a body of information that presents a kind of representation of ourselves to whatever audience we imagine we have on social media. And that produces a very different set of news considerations, of kind of gatekeeping considerations than a traditional news outlet might have. When we present ourselves on social media, for instance, we might want, we tend to want, to present an image that is not wholly negative. So even if when we wake up in the morning, we go to the New York Times and we tend to focus on that negative information, what we circulate might be a different balance of negative versus positive information to paint a picture of ourselves that is less mopey, for instance. And we've seen evidence of that in past work. There's good work on kind of what leads to contagion in social media. And some of that work suggests that it's actually positivity as opposed to negativity. And that positivity probably is driven in part by the kind of personal connection this kind of self-representational part of social media. And, and, and I think these data are gonna demonstrate that. So imagine that what you do is take over the course of several months, the uh, top 10 lists, top 10 most read articles from the New York Times, top 10 most uh, Twitter posted and Facebook posted and most emailed articles from the New York Times. Okay, let's take those top 10 lists and alongside those top 10 lists scraped from the New York Times website, let's add, of the full content of all those news articles, okay? And then let's take, um, let's use, a, in this case, an automated dictionary to extract the sentiment of all of those articles. And then based on that entire time period, let's look at the distribution across all articles of sentiment, positive to negative, for all the most read articles over that period versus all the most Facebook posted articles over that period, and so on, and so on. If we do that, we get a distribution for viewed stories that looks like this. Actually, it, the, the mean is just a little bit on the red side, okay? But you can see there's a kind of there's a nearly even distribution here. But the mean is on the red side. That's basically what we would expect given what we saw in psychophysiology, for instance. If it's true that, that psycho, those psychophysiological reactions are driving our news selection, then we would expect, just as we saw in those psychophysiological reactions, for our, our viewed news content to lean a little negative, and that tends to be true. And that, that uh, I'll stop there, that tends to be true. But as we move to, for instance, the most tweeted stories, you can see the distribution shift in a positive direction. The most Facebook posted stories, you see it shift in a positive direction. And now we get to the kind of the most personal connection in information redistribution. The most emailed stories, you see it shift in a positive direction even more. As we change to platforms in which the considerations for newsworthiness change, in this case considerations for instance about self-presentation, we see a shift in the distribution of news content. And that for me is a nice indication of the ways in which technological change um, um, produce the possibility for news content that looks a little bit different than it has traditionally. It's the combination of overtime change, uh, individual level difference, and technological change that produces, in, in my view, uh, the increasing viability of good news. I put increasing twice on this slide. The increasing, increasing viability of, uh, of, of good news. And so that's my, that's the argument that I've been playing with pre- coronavirus, and now uh, I want to close up in two minutes, but I want to show you just a little bit of coronavirus data, and um, it's not going to be what you expect. I, I, I'm still trying to work through it. This might be what you expect, the first part. So here's what I did. Yesterday, I downloaded all of the New York Times Section A coverage. Okay, so I get it from LexisNexis. It's about 5,500 articles, uh, and it's every single Section A story in the New York Times. I've read zero of them. I just download them all. I stick them in a database, and then I'm going to do two dictionary-based analyses on them. The first, I'm going to take a dictionary of all the different words we use to name the novel coronavirus, and I'm just going to count up which articles, uh, how many articles have those words in them. And then I'm just going to plot over time the proportion of Section A coverage that deals with the um, with the novel coronavirus. And, and this is what that looks like. 
the first case, the first um, case was right, right at the end of 2019. So I'm plotting here from January 1st uh, until just a few days ago. And what you have here is kind of a three day rolling average in order to smooth the series a little bit. And what you have is, you know, between zero and 20% of front, way, front page coverage uh, leading up to, that's like up to about the third week of February. And then you start to see a really market increase, right? Particularly over March. And then you have this very high spike when we start to see a lot of cases in the US. And over the past week or so, between 60 and 80% of all front section coverage in the New York Times has had at least some mention of the coronavirus. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily directly about the coronavirus, but it mentions at least once uh, the coronavirus. That's a lot of coverage. Now, one expectation Hypothetically speaking, let's say my expectation going into this was that if I then took the tone of New York Times front section coverage, what I would find is that that tone becomes increasingly, increasingly, increasingly negative. That is, that if I took in, in every article, I counted up the number of positive words and counted up the number of negative words and produced a kind of measure of net sentiment and then plotted the, using exactly the same three-day rolling average, that net sentiment over time, what I would get is a line that is moving in exactly the opposite direction that in the new year, the New York Times Section A was relatively positive. And then as, um, as we got more and more coronavirus news, it became more and more negative. This is what I got. It's, uh, it's just always negative and basically a, a flat line. Now there's variation. There are days when the news is markedly more negative than other days, right? But what we're talking about here is a Section A that varies between moderately negative and very negative. And the punctuations in very negative here correspond to kind of major coronavirus events, if we can call them that. Um, so there's a kind of, there, the, the variation in here is systematic. I can see how it got there. But what we don't get is this steady decrease over time. Now, why don't we get that steady decrease over time? I think partly we don't get it because Section A of the New York Times is, for the most part, targeted at the average person. That is, it, it uses the concept of news that we've used for a very long time, and that is that news is on average negative, and so there's going to be a fair bit of negative news in Section A independent of the coronavirus. The other thing that's driving the results, and I haven't quite got this plotted in the way, a way I like yet, but the other thing that's driving these results is actually coronavirus news coverage. If we just look at the tone of coronavirus news coverage, it's actually most negative at the beginning and becomes systematically less negative over time. That's not because uh, there's a kind of distorted view necessarily of the coronavirus and news coverage. It's because as the... Um, as we start to react to the coronavirus, there's a combination of uh, negative content and positive content. Positive in the so, so, for instance, a story about how pop stars are reacting to the coronavirus, or what we can do to stay busy, busy in our homes, or how to look good on your webcam. Uh, and all of these new th this news coverage is, is a little more positive. That is, as we enter a period in which news is overwhelmingly negative, we start to see an increase in the in in positive, in slightly perhaps more outlying news coverage, a kind of balancing of the uh, of positive and negative news coverage. And we see that not just in New York Times coverage, but my guess is we can all think of examples of that in our own social media feeds and in our own use of different components of the media environment, our selection from a newspaper, our selection from social media over the course of a day in order to find the right balance ourselves of news that is positive and negative. So th this result isn't quite as I expected, but it may turn out to be the kind of uh, the uh, example that proves the rule that even in this instance of very, very negative content, there may be limits to how negative that content will be. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart, uh, for this, uh, this engaging talk. Um, uh, I, uh, I, we're opening the floor for the, the Q&A now, um, uh, which means that I will uh, read out the first question. I want to stimulate the uh, audience members who have been listening uh, to post questions in this uh, Q&A button uh, below. So the first question, uh, Stuart, is from Marike van der Velde, who is uh, an assistant professor at the VU University, our competitor in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, she uh, says, this is a great talk connecting many lines of research. I really enjoyed it. 
I especially think the argument directed towards news curation and recontextualization, the links shared on social media, uh, uh, is, uh, is great. My question is directed to the measurement of the positivity versus negativity. I'm wondering whether the measure would pick up sarcasm. My assumption, based on some manual annotation of the, uh, the vaccination debate in the Netherlands, is that people might want to complain in a witty manner. Can you measure, can your measure account for sarcasm? No, we're really, really bad at getting at sarcasm. And, and it's really, you know, the, so the dictionary based analysis is really hard at getting at sarcasm and even like kind of machine learning trained on humans uh, is really bad to, um, as in we take human codes and try to train a machine to replicate them. Even that's pretty bad at getting at sarcasm because the language, there isn't a, there aren't words that uniquely identify sarcasm from not sarcasm. That turns out to be very complicated, particularly when what we try to do is apply uh, a kind of sentiment analysis to social media, because social media is deeply sarcastic. Even the use of emojis, which is like the clearest form, like, which could in principle be like the simplest emotional signal um, in text, even those are used uh, sarcastically. Thankfully, sarcasm in the front section of the New York Times is relatively limited. So we assume that that that, um, that what we're getting that are the problems that sarcasm introduces for a measure like this are relatively limited. But the moment we move to other um, to other platforms, even the moment we move to television, any kind of spoken word content or social media, sarcasm is more prevalent, and the measure is more complicated. Okay, the second question is from uh, somebody that on Zoom goes by Tobia. Um, thank you for the talk. Coming back to the distribution of the uh, valence of shared stories in different social media, are those data from an English, uh, from English speaking population? Is there the same tendency across cultures? And related to this, are, these studies, are there studies that look how these sharing preferences change over time that are similar to the New York Times news coverage of COVID? If they are similar, can you speculate which one drives the other or if they interact? Thank you again. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so we, the New York Times, the data um, on sharing behavior from the New York Times, that we only have for the New York Times. We don't know if that's generalizable, but we, there's reason to suspect that it is, in part because of that psychophysiological work that shows so little systematic difference from one country to the other country to the other country. So let's assume, and it's an assumption at this point, but let's assume that that psychophysiology reflects people's, uh, the way in which we process and engage with information. If, if, if that psychophysiology captures that, then, then that study provides relatively strong evidence that there's not large cross-cultural variation, and thus we might expect similar sharing behavior uh, across cultures. Uh, in terms of sharing behavior over time, that's uh there's some work um there's some work that uh, i and co-authors have done and it's linked to on that website at the beginning uh that, that i mentioned at the beginning that shows the difference between for instance the um major newspaper coverage of the economy vis-a-vis -vis the economy and then twitter coverage coverage of the economy versus the economy so what does twitter say about employment versus what does the new york times say about employment and what we see is a negativity bias in the new york times but a but a positivity bias in social media and 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 there's reason to believe that that uh is adjusting over time in interesting ways although that paper takes only a first step uh towards towards looking at that my expectation is that it would be relatively easy to uncover changes in the balance of positive versus negative information being recirculated, let's say about the economy um, in relation to the economy over time. But I have not quite done that yet. That's an interesting possibility for future work for sure. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question is from uh, Diamantis Petalas, a postdoc at the Free University. Uh, hi all, thanks Stuart for the talk. I'm curious uh, if you think the degrees, the degrees over time you do not see in your New York Times data would be visible once the curve starts to flatten. In other words, wouldn't you expect the sentiment to be correlated with the number of deaths and recoveries in real life? Uh, 
Yeah, um, I, I would, though in this case, so let me start that again. Yes, I would. I, I do expect that coverage of um, deaths due to the coronavirus or the spread of the coronavirus, I expect that coverage in the New York Times to be, uh, to be relatively accurate. Uh, that said, I don't have a good sense for whether, if what we're looking at is just Section A coverage, whether we should expect any variation over time. I've been kind of rethinking, maybe Section A always is this kind of standard balance of positive and negative news. And if what we do is plot Section A coverage, it's just gonna keep looking like Section A coverage. Within that, there's a lot of interesting variation that I'm just missing. That if I just look at coronavirus coverage, for instance, we see an interesting reaction, an interesting shift in actually positivity in, in coronavirus coverage. Uh, and within other coverage, we see corresponding shifts. If we think of section A or think of our brains as seeking out a kind of given distribution of information at any point in time, and we think of the kind of information that information as part of a kind of broader information environment, then maybe the way to think of this is there's going to be coronavirus news coverage and that coverage is going to respond to the coronavirus in interesting and asymmetric ways, shiftingly asymmetric ways over time. And then other coverage on less salient topics is going to respond accordingly. That is when coronavirus coverage is very, very negative, we see an increase in cat pictures. I'm sure we've seen that on social media, right? In fact, we have all we can all remember tweets in which we've seen exactly that. I'm getting tired of all this negative news coverage. Please send me some cat pictures. That tweet has totally happened. So maybe what we have are, are like uh, is a kind of salient news stream that is primarily coronavirus right now, and then those other information streams adjust in order to produce a section A or a brain's worth of information that is the distribution that like our that we are seeking. Thanks again, Stuart. Um, the, the next question is from Philip Mendoza, who's a, a master's student here at the University of Amsterdam and also working in our lab. Uh, super interesting to see how the average sentiment of shared articles changes across sharing platforms. Can you say anything regarding the degree to which the di this difference in average sentiment could be due to different users selecting into different new sharing channels? Yeah, uh, that's really, that's a good point. So we, um, we don't, we can't tell from our data uh, whether the extent to which we're capturing the same people sharing on Facebook and Twitter and email versus different people sharing in those different ways. What we can do is just say, this is what like the totality of Facebook sharing looks like. This is what the totality of uh, email sharing looks like. But it invariably is a function of some combination of people making decisions, like this is something that I would give to my grandmother. This is something that I would post on Twitter or something that I would read but not repost. Some combination of that and then actually different people, people who are whose kind of default sharing environment is Facebook and that's because they are inclined for whatever reason to engage in Facebook and share the kinds of information that one would share on Facebook. And so they end up sharing in that way versus somebody whose inclination is to just share the information, I guess predominantly positive information through email with friends. Some combination of the same people doing different things and different people doing different things. We can't tell from our data, but that again is a really interesting um, area for further analysis. Great, the next question is from you. Judith Miller, who uh, is from Oscor and recently visited you, I believe, in, in uh, Michigan. Uh, considering uh, the amount of disinformation about Corona at the moment that is very often positive, the garlic cure, etc., do you think that the overwhelmingly bad news created fertile ground for fake positive news? Uh, and is there a general need for positive news, especially in hard times? So yes to both those questions. I do think that the overwhelmingly negative true news about the coronavirus produced fertile ground for fake positive news about the coronavirus. I think that's unquestionably true. Uh, and I also think that in tough times, humans, and, and this is the, the first is partly about the second, in tough times, that is when we are faced with an overwhelmingly negative information environment, we look for ways to balance that 
we look for ways to balance that out. One of the things that I haven't done, um, but is actually relatively straightforward to do with the data that I currently have, for instance, is to extract, let's say, any, any paragraph in which there is a quote from Donald Trump. Okay? So you might expect, given that he was saying positive things for a very long time, and then negative things briefly, and now positive things again, um, there's reason to expect that part of what's going on in this in, in the overall sentiment measure is some combination of accurate information about the coronavirus and inaccurate commentary about the coronavirus. And that's, that's part of what we see as well. It may actually be that the, um, that the kind of balancing out, and this is what you is suggesting, I think in part, it might just be, might be that part of the, um, the moderation in sentiment over the past, let's say over the past week, for instance, has to do with uh, factually untrue claims by the administration about how this is gonna be over soon and we're all gonna be fine. I can't yet tell from these data, though, though one could. Yes, thanks. Um, next question is from Amanda Friesen. Um, she wonders how might these trends be unique to COVID-19 given people are sheltering in place likely more did say they might likely have more time on their devices etc yeah that's a really good point I, I i i think that um i think we're unquestionably living through a very uh interesting period where with the study of communication is concerned that we have moved a lot probably moved a lot more of communication online in one form or another including this and that that changes fundamentally the information that we um, inter engage with and the, inter the information that we send out there into the world. And uh, so there are going to be a whole bunch, I suspect, of fundamental ways in which uh, our communication about politics and about the world and generally is going to change fundamentally, is going to be different now and over the next months as it, than it was uh, a few months ago. M my guess is that. Um, where uh, asymmetries based on valence are concerned, my guess is that that actually hasn't um, isn't gonna isn't different now than it was before. That there's something fundamental um, about the uh, about our need to our interest in positive and negative information and our ways of categorizing and seeking information based on valence. And that that is, I suspect, as true now as it has been at any other time. But the way in which we engage and seek that information and that balance of information is going to be fundamentally different. Okay, the next question is from uh, Rens Vliegenthard, who is the uh, scientific director of OSCOR. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Would you expect that the tone of coverage on COVID depends on more detailed topic that is discussed? And what kind of topics would have a more moderate tone? Uh, I assume that the spread of infection, but also the stock market coverage, is overwhelmingly negative. I think that's unquestionably true. And I mean, then Rens knows uh, better than I the kind of average tone of uh, economic coverage and the asymmetries that are those kind of strong negativity biases that are built into kind of. Uh, economic coverage. Add to that the fact that the economy actually is doing quite badly uh, and there's been lots of negative economic news. My expectation is that if we extracted just the negative, uh, just the economic coverage, what we would see is some remarkably negative um, coverage. I, I'm like pausing as I think about what Trump has been saying about the economy. We still need to separate out the Trump stuff from the economy stuff. Um, uh, my guess is that the, uh, the scientific coverage be I would say quotes from scientists and, and, and claims about the science of things that probably also is pretty negative right now. Uh, I think what we're, the areas in which we see positive coverage are the kind of areas that I was joking about earlier, but there is a lot of that coverage, like how to stay interested, how to, how to engage in the arts, how to see an opera, uh, what different um, what different stars are doing um, or what different writers are doing while they're locked in their houses. I think that's where we see this kind of balancing, this kind of introduction of coronavirus stuff, the kind of newspaper equivalent of cat pictures, which is, ha which is the form it takes, which is the, like pets is the form it, it takes on social media, right? 
Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Francisca Mar Marcon, also from the University of Amsterdam. Thank you for your talk. Drawing from your individual data, can you say something about ideological preferences for news positivity, negativity, also across cultures? <laughs> this is a question for you, Bert, not for me. <laughs> uh, as uh, as uh, Bert and Gijs and uh, Vin Arsenault and Patrick Fournier and Lila Kneer and myself and, uh, and, and Michael Ben Peterson and uh, and uh, the Nebraska team, uh, as we uh, as uh, that group and an increasingly large group knows, uh, although there is a body of work uh, from uh, eight or so years ago that uh, and also other interesting work too that connects uh, predisposition towards a negativity bias with conservatism. Uh, those studies have been difficult to replicate, uh, both cross-nationally and within the U.S. Um, and so there are kind of two possible, there are more than two, there are two possible responses to that. Uh, and we, I don't think we know which one is true yet, I don't think. Uh, one is, uh, these are noisy data, and the initial finding was just luck. And uh, when we try to do it again, we can't find it, and so we should throw it away. That's version one. Version two is uh, there actually is a link between ideology and negativity bias and in information processing, but that link is contingent on uh, domain and a whole bunch of other factors. That is, in specific domains, let's say when thinking about, I don't know, immigration, uh, in the context of uh, immigration policy debate, there may be an association between a negativity bias and the processing of that information or a negativity bias generally and how we respond and, and how we respond and, and it, our ideology, our ideological placement on this kind of immigration policy domain. I think I did a bad job of that. But that may be different from one domain to the other and there may in fact be areas in which actually negativity biases are associated with more liberal positions as opposed to more conservative positions. Uh, there is, um, and I think there's, I'm confident, there's a kind of growing body of work that's doing a really interesting uh, job of trying to tease out those possibilities. Did I manage to dodge that question adequately? <laughs> it was not my question. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, I, I, it's, uh, I couldn't, this is, this is uh, it's really interesting. We'll go on to the next question. Uh, that's from Miriam, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I just wanted to observe that in our current situation, I see people on Facebook actively trying to balance their bad news, usually related to the pandemic by consuming wholesome content. Cute animal videos and pictures are on the rise. Is, there an er is, is this an area you're interested in looking into, or are you aware of someone else research on this topic? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody uh, doing that kind of work right now, but I would strongly encourage it, mainly for reasons that we were I, uh, that we, that I was talking about in response to Amanda's question. The um, you know, the fact that so much of our communication has moved online now means that for researchers, we can get, proportionally speaking, we can look at a lot more of your total information flow than we are normally able to. You know, when I normally tell the kind of uh, kind of negativity bias story. I talk about uh, how this kind of positivity offset, this kind of expectation of marginally positive, that things will be marginally positive, that can't be driven by political news content, which is predominantly negative. It's driven by the information that we get over the course of our day. And that information is some combination of what you get in media, but also all the many personal interactions that you have over the course of a day. The kind of basic positive feedback you get when somebody lets you get onto the bus first, or somebody holds a door open, or you see somebody at a coffee shop and you have a positive, uh, positive interaction. We're not normally able to observe that, but we're almost able to observe all of that right now, right? That stuff doesn't exist anymore. All of our information is digital, right? And almost all of our information is digital. It's a really unique moment for communication scholars to be able to look at I don't know, not 20% of what your information flow is over the course of a day, maybe 80%. That would be super interesting. 
the next question is from uh, Claire Goffro, who's a researcher at the Center for American Women and Politics. And also a shout out to Claire, one of the key contributors to the replication debate on the negativity bias. Um, and, uh, yes, I should have said Claire, I apologize. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> but, but it's true. Uh, but, uh, so she thanks you for uh, such an interesting and engaging talk. I have a question about gender differences in attentiveness to negative news. Of course, I always have to ask about the gender question. Uh, there is some evidence, support, support by some of your own research, that women are more attentive than men to negative news content. Does your current data speak to these differences at all? And how do you think this might play out in regards to COVID-19? I can see maybe women seeking out more negative news and perhaps practicing social distancing more vigil vigilantly than men, for example. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, generally speaking, there aren't a lot of demographic variables that we can connect with individual level differences in uh, negativity biases, psychophysiological uh, negativity biases. Gender is one of the rare exceptions. And actually, we find that often it's, it's men that exhibit a slightly higher negativity bias as opposed to women. And we've tried to use that as, a, as one way of maybe accounting for uh, decreased interest amongst women in politics because of the general tone of politics. Um, but I, I actually expect for that gender difference to vary a fair bit across domains. And certainly if we look at um, like evolutionary psychology, there are reasons to expect that there are domains in which women would exhibit stronger negativity biases and domains in which men would exhibit stronger negativity biases. That the kind of way in which we process information based on valence is going to vary across genders in different contexts at different times. And, and that that may help us account for, in this instance, let's say different social media behaviors across different genders on the coronavirus and on a, any other, uh, and, and on a range of other topics. That's very close to saying, I have no clue, it's all over the place. Um, and, and that's maybe an accurate, that maybe that's kind of how I feel. It's uh, it, not that this is, um, not that there are unintelligible differences and it's all noise, but there's a lot of, I mean, I think that's what, it's part of my emphasis in my second argument today, that there's just a lot of individual heterogeneity and that that individual heterogeneity is changing over time and in, in understandable, but very complex ways. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ernesto de Leon. He's a research master student in the social sciences at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I look at emotional reactions to news in my thesis, so I'm interested in your measure of positivity negativity. Could you elaborate on the method you use to classify these art articles sentiments, whether a dictionary-based approach or training classifiers gives you more accurate results? I can also imagine these methods work better or worse depending on the topic being discussed. Yeah, that, so uh, they unquestionably are better or worse based on the, depending on the topic being discussed, partly because some topics necessarily require using language that is in, that's, that is, um, indistinguishable from sentiment generally, right? So let's say articles about war are gonna involve some words that you can purge from, the from a sentiment dictionary, but that makes the sentiment dictionary inaccurate. And that makes it really hard to, pur to separate out sentiment from topic. And often when we want to extract sentiment, it, we can focus on sentiment within a given topic, as opposed to um, like make comparisons within that topic, as opposed to make comparisons across topics. Uh, all of that is to say, the method I'm using in this case is a dictionary. It's I'm using the Lexicoder Sentiment Dictionary, which Lori Young and I built in the, it's published in 2012, so we built it a few years before that. Uh, and it's about 6,000 words, about 3,000 positive, about 3,000 negative, and it's been tested against human coders, and it's been, um, uh, with, um, it, it, with co-authors been translated to other languages and tested in the context of legislative debates as well as in television transcripts and news content. Uh, it has been for us a pretty reliable measure of sentiment broadly construed, keeping in mind that we cannot get sarcasm, that there are going to be variations in sentiment across, across uh, different topics, and that in this case we mix in um, the sentiment of true facts about the coronavirus from the sentiment of commentary about the coronavirus, which may or may not, which may or may not be um, be accurate. 
it it tends to be true this is just i have no single piece to point at for this i'm going to make the claim anyway it tends to be true that if what we do is train uh, machine learning on human coding in a specific domain that that will extract sentiment more reliably than this kind of general purpose sentiment dictionary, right? Because the sentiment dictionary is not trained on any single corpus, right? It's trained on front section coverage generally, tested in some other, on, on some other corpuses, but it's not tuned in the way in which we can tune machine learning and human coding, right? So if you take humans and you have them code just coronavirus coverage, and then you train a machine to replicate that human coding, that should be better than a general purpose dictionary like this. If it isn't, there's a problem. Uh, either the dictionary is magic or, or, um, or the human coding is noisy. And that's, that's the core concern with the machine learning is that uh, human coding often is really flawed and human coding for tone is especially flawed. So sometimes the machine learning won't get you any kind of improvement because the machine is only as good as the humans. That's a very long-winded, windy uh, way of saying, uh, I'm using a dictionary. It tends to, on average, uh, work for the purpose that I'm using it here. It is possible in principle to improve on it, though hard in practice. Okay, Stuart, I also have a, have a question. Um, and it's related to, to mute avoidance. Um, and so it's a, it's a theoretical question, but also has, has some implications for how you've been studying this at the, at the, the micro level. So if, if one, of, one of the theoretical arguments you'd have to say, well, some people are maybe actively avoiding negative news. Uh, that, that could be, you know, you'd somebody say, like, I've had enough of all this negativity, all this conflict in politics. And that's not per se just Donald Trump, but just generally uh, a conflict. So if people do this, and uh, you, in the lab studies you're doing, you're forcefully exposing people to watch negative and positive news, are we then maybe overestimating partly the extent to which uh, people, uh, to which negative news is arousing and attention grabbing, because a lot of people might, might be, now I'm thinking about the, uh, the old Iyengar work, if you would give people the possibility to, to tune out of the remote of the negative news, would they do so? So, so what would you, your expectation, do you think that, that exposure is an issue, selective exposure here, and how would it affect the conclusions you draw? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, that's a really interesting question. We do force people into viewing things as opposed to allowing them choice. And as a consequence, what we're getting is their reaction to stuff that they have not chosen for themselves. And we don't really know how that matters to their reaction. Right? If I'm a person who I'm just not interested in negative news anymore, does that mean that when you force me to watch negative news, I'm highly attentive to it and I wish that I wasn't, but I'm stuck in it? Or does that mean that I am not attentive to it? I'm like, that's oh, negative news, I'm just tuning out. My expectation, my kind of gut belief is that it's the latter. That if you're not interested in that negative information anymore, then even if I force you to see it, you're going to just you're going to tune out. But I don't have uh, I don't have good evidence for that. What we are starting to be able to do is to connect the psychophysiological work with some work using this uh, on online video games that capture learning mm -hmm. to, uh, based on the valence of information. Capture that. The first thing to the second thing to our behavior in headline selection tasks. So we know, for instance. Uh, and this is um, this is work with Dominic Valentino and Lauren uh, Guggenheim that's uh, un under review. But uh, we know that your behavior in like an online race car video game, uh, fr from that behavior, we can extract your tendency to learn more from negative information versus positive information. And we can see that then playing out as in that is correlated then with your behavior in a headline selection task. The information that is more meaningful for you is the information that you tend to select when you when you go to read headlines, even though the meaningful for you we're getting from your behavior in a car or video game, and then the headline tasks are are um, are kind of standard news headlines. So that connection suggests to us that your headline selection, that your decision to engage in information is driven by an interest in, let's say, uh, 
in, in, in one type of information versus another type of information. If you're willing to take the small leap, that heart rate variability is a signal of your of differences in your um, in your interest to in the way in which your your, your attentiveness to and, and mm -hmm. the way in which you're processing information, then that's maybe a hint that uh, selective exposure uh, that kind of information selection decisions are governed by some of the same dynamics that we see in the psychophysiological work. But you, there's a lot of I've been mean, taking several leaps there, and you're you're right that the psychophysiological work is flawed in that the evidence we have there is conditioned on you're watching what we give you, not you're watching what you choose. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm gonna give advice. Thanks, uh, Stuart, a lot for this. Uh, a lot of interesting questions, uh, great answers too. I'm also happy that uh, one person slept through the entire talk. Uh, Wies Bakker, she's you, you may be able to see her just you know on, on Bert's uh, video. <laughs> um, uh, of course, uh, uh, if you give a talk at the Hot Politics Lab, you receive this uh, mug, and so Stuart. It's a nice uh, mug. Yeah. <laughs> If uh, if ever I can get back to my office where the supplies of my uh, of my mugs are, then uh, then I will send you one. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, also announce next week's talk. Uh, we'll have Julia van Wiert, uh, professor in health communication at the uh, at Oscar, the Amsterdam School for Communication Research, who is also currently serving as an expert for the Dutch health authorities to. Um, uh, 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 advise them on how to communicate uh, uh, to the larger population. So this will be also, this will be again a very interesting talk, but also there will be a component where you might actually be able to give her some good ideas as how to uh, uh, communicate to the uh, population at large to, uh, for example, enforce compliance with uh, uh, new, uh, new measures taken. Um, uh, at the peak today, we had 62 participants, uh, so I'm really happy with this. Feel free to, after this, to sign up to our newsletter so that you get all of the updates uh, for our talks coming weeks and the weeks after this. Um, I think uh, this is really growing out to be something really exciting, and I'm very happy. I want to thank everyone for their uh, participation uh, today, and uh, hope to see you uh, on Zoom, and, 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 and hopefully uh, somewhere this summer or off. And uh, for real. Okay, this was it for today. See you next week. Thanks very much. Thank you.